fit to run who, or who's trying to keep from getting run, or who's trying to run somebody else. That's all that thing is. All that goes on in a newspaper is just 35 pages of sheer, unadulterated junk arguing about who gets the upper hand. The problem in the American home today is authority. Did you know that? You know what the problem is in the pulpit? It's authority. If you don't have an authorized Bible, you have no authority. The problem is authority. Always has been authority. Take your Bibles in Isaiah chapter 14. Let me show you something. In Isaiah chapter 14, I'll show you something somebody said before Adam was made. I'll show you something somebody said before God said, let there be light. Before God opened his mouth in Genesis 1, somebody said something. And it's in Isaiah chapter 14. Now you get Isaiah chapter 14 in one hand, you get Revelation 22 in the other. You get the last chapter in the Bible, Revelation 22. Then you get Isaiah chapter 14. And I'll show you something in Isaiah 14 somebody said before God made anything. And if he, what he said was said after God made the heavens and the earth, Genesis 1, at least it was said before God said, let there be light. That is, before God said anything that's recorded in the Bible, somebody else said something in Isaiah 14, 13. Isaiah 14, 13, I will ascend and put my what? My what? Throne. See that? The first thing in that Bible is about a throne. It's not about your salvation. The first thing in that Bible is who gets to run who? Who's king? Now turn to Revelation chapter 22 and look at the last book in your Bible. Uh, unsaved people, they think when they hang around their television sets and get the news, they're getting something that's uh, entirely different from, than the Bible. And unsaved people, they think you people spend time in the Bible are wasting your time because you don't know what's going on. Why, the Bible begins with the argument about authority and ends with the argument about authority. The argument about authority is a Bible argument. And if you're on what the Bible says about these matters, you're way ahead of any newscaster. All right, Revelation chapter 22, Revelation 22, verse 5, toward the end of the verse, they shall reign forever and ever. See that? R-E-I-G-N. You know what a reign is? It's a king on a throne. You know where you're going to be someday? You're going to be on the throne and they shall reign forever and ever. Back there in Isaiah chapter 14, the devil said, I'm going to run it, I'm going to reign. And the Lord said, you're not going to reign, you're going to be brought down to hell with the sides of the pit. So the main thing in the Bible is, to is talking about a throne, the main thing in the Bible is an argument about who gets to run who, and that's why all newscasts deal with that subject. You know what they're doing in NATO tonight, in the United Nations? They're arguing about who gets to run who. You know what they're doing in the schools, the National Education Association, the NACP, and the HEW? They're arguing about who gets to run who. You know what the HEW wants to do? Wants to run this school, runs this church. That's all there is to it. There isn't anymore. Every argument in this world is an argument about authority. In the home, who runs the home? ERA. Every rotten apple. <laughs> in the home, who gets to run the home? Can you imagine what it would be like if you really had equal rights? Suppose you were a man, and your, your wife was equal to you in every way, like they say, and then you're upstairs one night, and there's a sound downstairs like a burglar, and you say to your wife, honey, would you go down and see what it is? <laughs> Wouldn't that be something? How can a man retain his self-respect sending his wife down to check on a burglar? <laughs> Somebody have to go down and check them. Who would it be, you or your wife? People are weird. Now, you take that business about authority in the home, the thing is, who gets to run the home? Is the father in charge or is the mother in charge? You say they're both in charge. Where, when they differ, who, may, who decides? Why, well, that's easy. You've got anarchy. Any fool can figure that out. Well, you have two conflicting authorities that equal, you have anarchy. Can't you figure that out? You folks look like you're supposed to have some sense. Sure you can figure that out. Who, children's rights. Who runs the children's home? Do they run themselves? The parents run them. You see equal authority. What do you do when they conflict? Anarchy. Any fool can figure that out. You've got to be half crazy if you can't see that. You've got to be demented, man. You've got to be sick in the head. You have one Bible here that says one thing, another Bible there that says another. But equal authority, <laughs> then you have anarchy. You have no authority. Anybody can figure that out. Look at here is God. God's running the universe, right? The devil's running the universe, right? Is the devil equal with God? If he is, you have anarchy. Any blank idiot can figure that out except a Bible scholar or an educator. <laughs> they have a terrible time with that thing. All right, now I'll take your Bible and turn to Lamentations. 
Lamentations chapter 5, verse 16 and 19. Somewhere there has to be a deciding authority. In a church, when the opinions conflict and there are problems, there has to be one final authority to make the final decision. And if you don't, you have anarchy in the church. In the pulpit, there has to be one Bible that decides issues, and if you don't have one Bible, you've got anarchy in the congregation. All right, now you take Lamentations chapter 5, verse 16 and 17, if you can find it. How many have found it? Would you raise your hand? Well, that's pretty good. All right, Lamentations, Lamentations chapter uh, 5, verse 16 and 19. The Jews there are talking about their demise, their demise, and about Nebuchadnezzar taking them over. And they say in the passage there, the crown, the crown is fallen from our head. The crown is fallen from our head, but thy throne, O Lord, endures forever, from generation to generation. See that thing? You know what that shows you? That shows you God has a kingdom on this earth, and he gave those folks a crown, and they lost that crown. When Jesus Christ was crucified on Calvary's cross, does it say on the cross, God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son? Of course not. What does it say on the cross? Christ died for your sins according to the Scriptures? Of course not. You know what it says on the cross? It says, this is Jesus of Nazareth, the King, the King of the Jews. You know what it says on his vesture when he comes back? It doesn't say, here comes your Savior and God loves everybody and share your experience. It says, King of kings and Lord of lords. You know what that Bible's about? It's about a throne. Salvation is incidental. I mean, I thank God I'm saved. I'm glad I'm not going to hell. Praise God he loved me enough to die for me. I don't discount it. But I got good sense, man. I know the main thing in that Bible is not Jesus Christ saving me. For one thing, I ain't worth saving. And for the second thing, there's so many of us down here, we're just like a pile of ants, and what difference would it make anyway? The main thing of that Bible is the king, the king, the king, the king. So I'm going to talk about tonight. All right, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. When God put that thing up, he put a king over that thing. We know the name of that king, because to this day, he's called the God of this world. He's the God of this world. When God put that king over there on that new earth, he put a crown on his head. And that blue crown represents the kingdom of heaven. Like you look it up in the air, the sky blue. And he put a purple crown on his head, and that purple crown in this diagram will represent the kingdom of God, royalty, the king, God, the king. Two crowns. In the Bible, there are two kingdoms. There's the kingdom of heaven, there's the kingdom of God. They're never the same. But you know why they're not the same? Because they're not spelt the same. <laughs> Somebody says, the kingdom of God is the kingdom of heaven. It couldn't possibly be. Birds fly in the heavens. They don't fly in God. God is a spirit. The heavens aren't spirit. The heavens are material. You can step out that door tonight after the sun goes down, look up there and see the stars up there. You can see heaven. You can't see God. The kingdom of God has never been the kingdom of heaven. When you see this crown here, it always re represents a literal, physical, visible kingdom on this earth. Whenever you see that top crown, that represents an invisible, spiritual kingdom of righteousness. You know what Paul says the kingdom of God is in the Romans? He said the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, that's physical, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. The kingdom of God is spiritual. It's never been physical, never been literal. The kingdom of heaven has always been literal. It's always been physical. That's where Garner Chet Armstrong gets some of you suckers. You get to listen to that world tomorrow and the plain truth and all that garbage. You get to listen to that junk and you say, well, well the Bible doesn't say we go to heaven, you know. Well, Garner Chet Armstrong's right. Technically, you go to New Jerusalem that comes down from God out of heaven. See? Now, we use the expression, it's perfectly all right to use. Talk about a Christian going to heaven. But when you start thinking about it, the heavens are, is this stuff here. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The heavens are material, God's not. Look at here. In the beginning, God created, but not the same. The creation's over here. The creator's over here. Now, if you're a dialectical materialist or a philosopher like Pythagoras or Protagoras or Thales or Anaximenes or Anaximander or Socrates or Plato or Sartre or Kierkegaard or any one of those deluded idiots, if you're one of those fellows there, you know what you think? You think the material universe is eternal. You think the universe has always been here. 
And did you ever stop and think what, a, what, what, what you'd have to believe to believe that? Suppose you thought the universe had always been here, the eternity of matter. Uh, where did it come from? You say it didn't come from. It was just there. <laughs> Can you imagine material that has always just been there? Why, if it's always been there, it's equal with God. You know what you'd be? You'd be a materialist. You'd worship matter. If it's eternal, God's eternal. If it's infinite, God's infinite, then it's God. You'd say, well, one of these fellows said the National Education for the Advancement, uh, Latin National Association of Advancement of Science, he said the heavens don't declare the glory of God, the heavens are the glory of God. No, they're not. They declare the glory of God. Now, look at here. You folks I'm talking to right now, are you material? Aren't you running down? Some of you look like a hair is coming out on top. Some of your hair is turning gray, some of you turning white, sometimes some of you fall out, your chest is slipping on you, your stomach's bagging out, your arches are dropping, your teeth are coming out, you need glasses. Why would you think that material was eternal? That'd be a crazy, stupid thing to think. Everything you see is material is falling apart. You see this building? It's falling apart. <laughs> if you don't believe it, ask the janitor. <laughs> you see that car you got parked out there in the parking lot? Do I have to tell you it's falling apart? <laughs> Rolling pile of junk. Guy says, for $500, we'll make this engine purr. You say, well, how about just making it meow? <laughs> A guy said, we want to put a tiger in your tank. And the guy said, well, we could, we'll we put a rabbit in your tank for short hops. <laughs> I like a cartoon I saw one time of a guy taking a used car back to a used car lot. And it was coming there, you know, smoking and puffing and blowing and coming there one piece at a time. And, you know, oil and gasoline dripping out of it. And the guy who bought it telling the dealer, he's saying, won't you tell me again what a fine car this was? It gets awful discouraging at times. <laughs> now, what you have out in that parking lot is a rolling pile of junk. That's what you've got. Now, it may be a $9,000 Cadillac, a $10,000 Lincoln, or a $3,000 Ford. You know what it is? It is a rolling pile of junk, is what it is. And some of them go to junk in four years. Some of them go to junk in 10 years. Some real good ones run 15 years. But he will eventually wind up in a junk pile because it is junk. <laughs> That's all it is. Now, why would you believe in that material was eternal when everything you see falls apart? One time, one of those uh, space fellows said to one of our men from Russia, he said, why, we were up there in the capsule, and we stepped out, looked outside the capsule there, and walked around outer space, and we didn't see God out there. God isn't real. We didn't see him. Why, if, God, if you could see God, he wouldn't be real. He'd be a fake. Because everything you see falls apart. Now, look here, brethren. The only thing real in this universe is God. Everything else is a fake. Because everything else is subject to the second law of thermodynamics, where there's entropy in a closed system, which means in school language, the cotton-picking thing falls apart. It deteriorates. You take a hermetically sealed sardine can in a vacuum, put it in the shelf, and 35 years it'll be rotten. I don't care how hermetically vacuum-proof it is, in 35 years it'll rot, and if it won't, give it 350 years and it'll rot. And if any good enough for you, try two million. A fellow said, the material universe has always been here. Why, if it had always been here, it would run down millions of years ago. <laughs> if this universe had been here for 50 billion years, it had completely folded up 150 million years ago because it all runs. Set clock up there, it's running down. <laughs> Did you ever wind up a clock? You know what happens to them? They never run up. They run down. Now, if you could see God, you know what that means? That means he wasn't there. What you see is what God made in the beginning. God created the heaven and the earth, and what you see is running down, and God isn't. All right, God is Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending. He's outside his creation. He gives it to a being called Lucifer. He has two crowns. Both kingdoms are present. He does something. You say, what does he do? I don't know what he does. But I know in Second Peter chapter 3, the Lord drowned the thing out with a flood. I know in Second Peter chapter 3 that in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, Something happened in that primitive earth. In the Christian colleges that some of you will go to and some of you have been to, they had big long arguments about the gap theory. And they say it was Genesis 1 2 a gap, and some folks think it was, and some folks don't think it was, and some folks say the Hebrew says this, something the Hebrew said that, and the Hebrew said this, and Dr. So and so says this. Just throw it in the wastebasket, kid. Second Peter chapter 3 says that thing was drowned. The flood in Second Peter chapter 3 is not Noah's flood. 
I don't care what Henry Morris and Wilbur Smith and the Christian Research Science Foundation say in California, they're wrong. <laughs> and if uh, you don't agree with that, well, then you're wrong, too. <laughs> Like the fellow said, in matters controversial, my perceptions are always fine. I always see both points of view, the one that's wrong and mine. <laughs> now, do you know how I know that thing was drowned out? I mean, I'm just kidding you. Shall I quit kidding you for a while? Okay. The Lord told that bird, be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth. Then it was something there before. The Lord told that bird, be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth. Therefore, there was something there before. You see that bird? He had three sons. You see that one? He had three sons. You see that one? One was under a curse. Ham. See that one? One under a curse. Cain. See that one? One a type of Christ. Shem. See that one? One a type of Christ. Abel. See that one? He was naked. See that one? He was naked. See that one there? He took something he shouldn't take. See that one there? He took something he shouldn't take. You know what happened before him? Water. You know what happened before him? I'll give you one guess. Second Peter chapter 3 said, The earth that then was was standing in the water, out of the water. The earth that then was being overflowed with water perished. There's no gap theory in the Bible. The gap is there, and God told you what happened when it was there. And the arguments about the gap theory is a bunch of nuts trying to make you think you have to know what they know to figure the thing out, and you don't. If you've got a King James Bible, you can figure it out without even trying. All right, so here was this character here showed up. You know what he said? He said, I'm going to put my throne above the stars of God. And the Lord said, no, you're not, and took the crowns away from him. You know what the Lord did? He gave both those crowns to Adam. Do you doubt for a minute that Adam was king over a literal, physical, visible kingdom? Why, the Lord told Adam, he said, be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth, the earth, the earth, have dominion. That's what a king does, dominion, dominion over the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air. And you know what he gave him? He gave him another crown. How do you know he had both of them? Because the Bible said Adam was made in the image of God. Adam was a dual king. How do you know he was made in the image of God? Luke chapter 3, and given the genealogy of Christ, says so-and-so was the son of so-and-so, so-and-so was the son of so-and-so. And when he gets down there to Seth, it says Seth, was the son of Adam, which was the son of God. He's got two, two crowns. You don't happen to Adam. Lord told Adam, he said, be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth. Tell me something, brethren. Did you ever stop thinking what would happen if Adam had done what God told him to do? What if Adam and Eve had gone on having children the way God told them to do, with no death and no disease and no wars? Was the Lord lying to them? He said, be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth. Do you know how many people would be on this earth now if Adam and Eve had gone on without sin, death, war, disease, with painless childbirth? Do you know how many people would be on this earth right now? There'd be about 154,000 per square foot. <laughs> you couldn't stand in each other. Well, you figure the thing out. Go back there 6,000 years and figure painless childbirth with no death for 6,000 years. Why, there wouldn't have been room to sit down. A fellow went to a tailor one time and he said, these pants are tighter than my skin. And the tailor said, that can't be. He said, it must be because I can sit out on my skin and I can't sit down in these pants. <laughs> now listen, if the Lord told Adam to be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth, was he just joking? If Adam had done what God told him to do, where would you put the people? Well, that's easy. It's out there. So these dumb scientists look up. They haven't got the sense God gave a brass monkey. And they look up in their telescope and they say, Oh, Jupiter, Venus, maybe my life up there, maybe I, maybe I... Say not, my heart, who shall ascend into heaven out there the constellation, galaxies, or maybe radio signals. Say not, my heart, who shall ascend up into heaven. And out there in the solar system, who knows if it can Say not, my heart, who shall ascend into heaven. Lord told you in Romans chapter 10 you had no business trying to get up there because what's up there you need has already come down going back up. Bunch of crazy, half-cocked, demon-possessed asses sitting down there in Houston and Cape Canaveral and Space Center. Hmm, maybe there's an intelligent life out there somewhere. Sure there is, man. So I've been here and gone. You missed it. <laughs> Why, listen, Jesus Christ came down from outer space and stood before Pontius Pilate, and Pontius Pilate said, Where are you from? 
Why, he knew where he was from. He just sent him up to Herod. When he learned that he was of Herod's jurisdiction in Galilee, he sent him to Herod, because Herod was in Jerusalem at that time. He knew where he was from, on the ground. And when he said, where are you from, you know what that is? That's an outer space question. Folks say, there's intelligent life out there? Sure there is. It just came down, went back up, and you missed it. <laughs> you know why men missed it? They want Barabbas. They want a sinner. They don't want a sin sinless man. So Adam's sitting down here, and uh, like a fellow said, it wasn't an apple in the tree, it was a pear in the ground. <laughs> and he's sitting down here, and uh, he loses. The devil comes around to Eve and says, uh, you happy? Yes. Have everything you want? Yes. No dishes to wash? No. No diapers to change? No. Husband love you? He thinks I'm the only woman in this world. <laughs> How about this tree over here? You want to eat of this tree? Well, God told us not to eat of that. I'll go on. I won't kill you. Takes a bite. Pops it in his mouth. Gives it to her. She eats. Whole thing goes out the window. And old story says, for want of a nail, the shoe was lost. For want of a shoe, the horse was lost. For the want of a horse, the rider was lost. For the want of the rider, the crown was lost, and all for want of a horseshoe nail. You know you know the Bible's the Word of God? Because it's so fantastic that only God could think of a thing like that. Think of punishing 150 billion people for one man taking something out of an orchard that didn't belong to him. I bet your standards aren't that high. I bet you don't have a law in Dayton, Ohio that says capital punishment for stealing a grape. But that's what Adam got. And all his descendants. The Lord's standards must be a lot higher than ours. All right, so Adam goes. You know what happens to old Adam? He loses the crowns. Off go the crowns. Adam loses them. The Lord comes along, drowns out the whole scene. Drowned out the whole scene, along comes Noah. Because old Noah he says, Build your boat. Noah builds the boat. Gets the thing all built. Folks making fun of him. Get up there preaching off the poop deck of that boat every afternoon, you know, and folks throwing rocks and beer cans at him. Put us in the rain, comes down, goes in that boat. When he went in that boat, he never knew when he was going to get out. It was like a coffin, a big coffin. The Bible said if a man will lose his life, he'll save it. And when no went into that coffin, do you ever stop thinking of an act of faith that was? When that bird got in that coffin, he never knew when he was going to get out. The Lord never told him he was ever going to get out. And he went in there with uh, six of his in-laws. Can you imagine being locked in a coffin with six of your in-laws for an indefinite period of time? And he went in there and stayed there. When he came out of that thing and stepped out, the Lord said, Okay, you are now king of the earth, Noah. Have dominion. Have dominion. And Noah said, Okay, Han, you take Africa, and Shem, you take Asia, and Japheth, you take Europe. And the kingdom of heaven doesn't begin with the Jew. It begins with Lucifer, and goes Adam, and goes to Noah. Noah has no kingdom of God. You know why? He's not made in God's image. Turn to Genesis 5. There's no kingdom of God on this earth for 4,000 years. Genesis chapter 5, verse 2, 3, and 4. Genesis chapter 5, verse 2, 3, and 4. Folks talk about, oh, Ruckman's a heretic. He teaches 4 or 5, plan the salvation. Everybody is saved by grace and this and that. I grant you everybody is saved by grace. I grant you that. If it weren't for the grace of God, nobody gets saved. But boy, if you think the methods that God did it were the same, you haven't read much Bible. Let me ask you something, brethren. If salvation in the Old Testament and the New Testament are the same, how come in the Old Testament nobody went to heaven when they died? Folks just don't even think. Back in the Old Testament, they went to Abraham's bosom. They didn't go into glory. How could you say they were the same? Oh, I know you come across there in Genesis chapter 5. Look at verse 1, 2, and 3. The, uh, the, uh, the generation, the book of generations of Adam, the day God created him, male and female created them and called their name Adam and Eve, right? Right? No, I didn't quote it right. Read your Bible. And he called their name what? There's no Eve to it. Where'd you get that stuff from? Folks get the wildest ideas, you know. Why, God never called her Eve. Adam called her Eve. In the day that God made him, he never gave her a name. And that's why you ladies don't have any name. You talk about ERA, you talk about how much you're crazy nuts. You ladies here, do you realize if that thing came through, you still couldn't get any name? You haven't got any names, you ladies. How many of you ladies are married? Let me see your hand. Married? You got your husband's name. How many of you are single? Let me see your hands. Single? 
You got your daddy's name. A woman doesn't have any name. Don't you know that? <laughs> Imagine Mrs. Obzuk, the R.A. Girl! <laughs> Why, that's her daddy's name, that old reprobate. <laughs> that old hypocrite, she hasn't got any name. That's her father's name. Why, if you got them all the same and had children, what would you give them? The mother's last name? If you did, it'd be her father's name. You'd have to make up names. You'd have to get married and give you your kid's name that wasn't your name. <laughs> and then when he had kids, you'd have to change the names again. ERA, all that stuff, man. A bunch of demented nuts running down this country. Now look down there, verse 2, 3, and 4. And Adam Cray had a son after his own likeness in his own image. What verse is that? 3. Verse 3, not in God's image. Isn't anybody in this building made in the image of God? Unless you receive Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, the image of God. There's no image of God from Adam till Jesus Christ shows up. So you can't have any new birth in the Old Testament. There's nothing to be born into. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Well, there's no kingdom of God there to see. All right, so you have Noah come along. That's what Calvin made such a mess of things. Boy, if he didn't make a mess of things. Poor old John Calvin said, Well, you see that? I had a hard shell Baptist hit me last time I was here for a while with some big jazz, and I don't know Hamilton, Ohio. I guess one of Eddie's boys, Eddie's boy. And, you know, he was saying, Well, now, if you're just dead and trespassed and sin, the Lord has to give you new life because you're dead and can't will to do anything. Hey, stupid, what about all those people from Adam to Christ? They were all dead and trespassed and sin. And none of them were born again. You mean to tell me David wasn't saved? Abraham wasn't saved? Isaac wasn't saved? Jacob wasn't saved? They were born dead in trespass and sin and died dead in trespass and sin. And they were saved. Calvin wasn't a very bright Bible student. He figured everybody in the Old New Testament was saved just alike. They were all chosen in Christ and all born again, all put into Christ. That's heresy. Nobody till Jesus Christ was put in Christ, and nobody to Christ was chosen in Christ because they weren't in Christ to get chosen. Got to get your Bible right. Okay, there's Noah. Now Noah shows up, when he steps out there, he has free confidence. He takes over. You know what happens? He gets drunk. And he gets drunk, and the Lord says, well, I can't trust him as a ruler. Uh, Noah messed up. You know the name of Noah's wife, don't you? Joan of Arc. <laughs> <laughs> ah, that's funny. <laughs> okay, so Noah came out there and got that thing going, and, and the Lord said, I can't trust him, I'll get me another king. So God got him another king. The name of this king here is Abraham. You doubt for a minute that Abraham was king? The Bible says the promise of the world was given to Abraham. Why, when he came out of the Chaldees, the Lord says in Psalm 105, the, ki the Lord reproved kings for his sake. You read in Genesis chapter 12, uh, in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. I'll bless those that bless thee and curse those that curse thee. And about the time the Lord called that king out, he said to himself, Now I'm always having trouble with these kings. <laughs> I get me one king here and he blows it. I put up another one, he blows it. I get another one, he blows it. Now the trouble is, these folks are born dead in trespass and sin. If I make a conditional covenant with them, they're going to mess it up. If I tell them, If you do this, map, this, map, this, and I give you the kingdom, they'll lose it every time. So he waited till this bird was asleep. And he came down and said, tell him what I'm going to do. I'm going to put you down in Egypt 400 years, and whatever and treat your seed, and after I'm going to bring you out, then you're going to get all this land. No condition. Grace. No conditions. An unconditional covenant of promise. You know why God did that? To guarantee that someday he'd get him a king there who'd stick. And he picked Abraham. Now, if you know your Bible, you know the rest of this business. That crown goes from Abraham and goes to Isaac and goes to Jacob. And, of course, all this time in the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, there's no new birth. Nobody is being born again. And the Lord's running that clan on down from one to another, and the Lord's finding himself a king. And the Lord takes that thing to Abraham and runs him down, and about to get him a king out of Abraham. About that time, uh, Ishmael shows up, and the Lord says, Well, I can't get a king out of him. He comes from Ham. See, he got that curse back there on Ham. That ain't going to work. So he said, I'm going to bless Isaac. So he gets Isaac going, and... About the time the devil sees Isaac going to get that crown, the devil comes up to God and says, hey, look here, you think you got a friend down there? Well, gee, I got a friend. The devil says, oh, he's not a friend like I got friends. The Lord said, I got a good friend you got a day in the week. 
The devil said, my friend loved me so much, they'll drown their children in the Ganges for me. They'll burn their babies in the fire for me. You don't have anybody who loves you like that. And the Lord said, yes, I do. The devil said, who? And he said, how thou considered my servant Abraham? And he said, he won't, he won't love you that much. The Lord said, you want to bet? The devil said, you're faded. Shoot. <laughs> That's the living Bible, I guess, I gave you there. <laughs> then he came down, and he came down to Abraham, and he said, Take now thy son, thine only son, Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee the land of Moriah, and offer him for burnt offering upon the mountains, I will tell thee of. And Abraham rose up in the morning, saw the ass, took the young man with him, and off he went. And he took that boy out there and put him down there in that uh, stone, took out the knife to kill him, and the Lord said, Hold the phone, stop him. And he said, Because you've done this thing, I'm going to bless so forth and so on. And then the Lord began to narrow that thing down. He was no longer just a Gentile, he was a Hebrew. He was no longer just a Hebrew, it was a Jew. And after it got down to a Jew, it got down to 12 tribes. It got down to Jacob. You know what Jacob means, don't you? He had a new name, Israel. You know what that means? That's a prince with God. A prince. A prince. That's a ruler. The theme of that book is a throne. The theme of that book is authority. That's the main theme of that book. The main theme of that book is who runs the universe. And the answer is God. Up there in Dysburg, Tennessee, some friends of mine were having a Bible study, and a little old 10-year-old girl came in, and she said, what's Jesus' last name? And they thought she was kidding, you know, and she kept hanging around and said, well, what's Jesus' last name? And they said, well, honey, we don't know. What is it? She said, amen. And they said, well, where'd you get that from? She said, well, he said, uh, in thy name, amen. <laughs> so his last name is Amen. I met a radio announcer in Baymanette one time. He was about 35 years old and a Episcopalian lay reader. And I got dealing about the Bible, about Christ. And one day he just suddenly showed it to me and he said, I'm saved and I'm called for the ministry and I'm going off study for the ministry. I said, what in the world happened to you? He said, well, you know that book you gave me by Clarence Larkin on dispensational truth? I said, yes. He said, I got reading that. And he said, the more I got reading that, the more confused I got. And he said, one night, he said, I just went in and out of my bed and I said, God, God, if you are there, I don't know who you are. Would you please tell me who you are? <laughs> and he said, the Lord said, uh, my name is Jesus. Like that. Wow, man. My name is Jesus. He trusted him, got saved, picked up the book, began to preach. This is Don Nesbitt, YouTube. All right, there's Abraham. There's Isaac. There's Jacob. What are we dealing with? We're dealing with the kingdom of heaven. There is no kingdom of God anywhere in the Old Testament. You couldn't find the kingdom of God in the Old Testament, a flashlight, because that's a spiritual kingdom. And when Adam fell and lost the image, his spirit was dead, dead in trespass and sin. The dead spirit man, every man born from him is born in his image. There is no kingdom of God anywhere in the Old Testament. So it goes Abraham, goes Isaac, goes Jacob. And it comes on down, it gets a little bit closer, a little bit closer. You get one of Jacob's boys. You know what the Lord has said about Judah? He said, listen, the scepter, Genesis 49, the scepter of the king shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, till Shiloh come to him to the gathering of the people be. And God got that thing down, first of all, to the human race, and then a member of the human race, and then a race in the human race, and then an individual in that race. Now, brethren, the thrones of this world do not belong to the U.N. General Assembly. The thrones of this world do not belong to the Habsburgs, or the Rothschilds, or the Rockefellers, or the Illuminati, or the uh, CFR, or UNESCO. The thrones of the world do not belong to the Tudors. They don't belong to the Plaginants, and they certainly don't belong to the Popes. Did you ever meet a Pope from the tribe of Judah? <laughs> some pope. The thrones of this world, they belong to the lion, the lion of the tribe of Judah. You know what a lion's called? He's called the king, the king of the beasts. That's the one. The king of the beasts. A little old colored boy reading a book one time, a Bible story book, and he said, he said, Mom, I said, didn't you say one time that the lion was the king of the beasts? And she said, yes, I did. And he said, well, Mama, there's a picture in this here book where a man is tearing a lion all to pieces. And she said, well, you can be sure one thing, son, that no lion painted that picture. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I like a story about a lion going to the jungle one day, and he came up to a gorilla, and he said, who's king of the jungle? And the gorilla said, you are. You're king of the jungle. Everybody knows that. He walked on to the jungle, he stopped him a rhinoceros, and he said, who's king of the bees? You're the king of the bees. Everybody knows that. He walked along, found an elephant, and he said, who's king of the bees? The elephant picked him up by his trunk, threw him about 50 yards, like to knock his brains out. And the lion got up and brushed himself off, and he said, you're just jealous because you're not king of the bees. <laughs> Now, in your Bible, in your Bible, there are two lions, the two lions, and one of them is not king of the beasts, and one of them is. But as your adversary, the devil that goes about as a roaring lion, and he's a second-run lion. <coughs> and the king of kings and lord of lords is the lion of the tribe of Judah. Judah. All right, it comes on down there and go a little bit further. When it comes on down there, it comes in a moves. And the Lord takes that a bunch from Judah and Isaac and Jacob and send them down to Egypt. And Moses persecutes them down there for 400 years, and out they come under Moses. When they come out of Moses, Moses out there at the burning bush, the Lord says to Moses, he says, uh, put your hand in your bosom. Sticks his hand in his chest, says, pull it back out again. Pull it back out again, leprosy. First man in the Bible ever got sick. First man ever got sick in the Bible was a Jew. You know why the Jews seek for a sign? Because the signs begin with the Jew. You know why Moses had the signs? Because he goes down to deliver Israel. You know what healing is? Mark chapter 16, these signs shall follow them that believe. It's Jewish. Moses puts down his hand, pulls it out, it's healed. Puts it in one time, sick, out again, healed. He said, you go down to those Jews and you show them that sign. It only about a sign, give you another one. Throws down the rod in the ground, turn to the serpent. Moses says, catch it. Moses says, catch your foot, and he begins to run. <laughs> And the Lord says, grab it by the tail. And Moses beating around that bush says, how can I grab that thing by the tail when it's chasing me by the head? And the Lord said, face it, boy, face it. I mean, resist the devil, he'll flee from you. So Moses turned around and faces that thing, and when he does, that snake turned around tail first, reached down, picks it up, turned back into a rod. I've always thought of when he slept after that, I bet he watched that rod when he lay down at night. You know that? How'd that rattle your day, man? You remember when, that, when Aaron's rod would swallow those other rods? You know, Aaron's snake swallowed the other one, and it turned into the rod again? That rod must have been that thick when he picked it up. <laughs> and you take those signs, they begin with the Jews. Now, you know why that's very important? Because you've had, had people all over Dayton, Ohio, that claim to have the apostolic signs, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever, and they're just a great big bunch of liars. Now, don't you get me wrong, I believe God heals people. You never convinced me any different. I'm not thin on healing. I'm thin on healers. The meanest devil in this world is a man to stand where I'm standing and make some of you folks think that it's your lack of faith that keeps you from getting well. That's the meanest devil you ever meet in your life. I mean, I have no more respect for him than a three-headed rattlesnake. I got a good friend named John Hall. He lives in a wheelchair. He'll die in a wheelchair. He got shot through the spinal column in Korea and... He lying out there for about 19 hours. He'd got gangrene, but it was a tracer bullet and cauterized the wound going through. Not old boy's in a wheelchair now for, well, since 1952. And he'll die in a wheelchair. I used to take him to healing meetings, and after a while, he knew it was fake. He knew they were faking. One day he said to me, he said, Pete, he said, I don't want to go to those healing meetings anymore. I said, okay, we won't. He said, I know they're lying, and he said, I know they're a bunch of crooks. But he said, when they start singing, only believe, only believe, all things are possible, only believe, he said, I just break out in a sweat. And I thought to myself, that dirty devil standing up there getting your pension and getting your Social Security and getting your money to try to buy your way through. You know something, when a person's sick, they want to get well. A person's sick, they don't, they don't most likely get well than anything. And a man that would take your money to do that is a dirty, low-down, cheap, rotten, devil-possessed crook, and that goes for any of them all the time, anywhere. You tell them I said so. Thank you. Amen. You want some more? I'll have it for you in a minute. I believe in healing. I've seen God heal. I've seen God heal my German shepherds. One got shot with number six shot and lay around foam at the mouth and his eyes rolling back for about four days. He's up and around. One of my German shepherds got hit by a car. Boom, came clear through, walked around two months with a spike stuck in his thigh. He's running now. You think I don't believe in healing? Every time you get talking like this, he's dumb, stupid, holiness people. Hey, don't believe in healing now. Ah, shut your mouth. Shut your mouth. I bet some of us Baptist preachers have prayed for more folks in hospitals that got out than you homeless people have. How many people ever had Brother Fleming come to the hospital and pray for you? Would you raise your hand? 
1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. You're a healer, man. You heal 19 people. <laughs> Isn't that some on a Monday night? No telling how many Sunday morning. <laughs> they say, put your hand on the radio for point of contact, you know. I like what Bob Gray says. He says, put it behind the radio. <laughs> you know, put it in the bowl of water. Stick it. <laughs> I'll turn you on. So I believe God heals, but I believe it's God will for some folks stay sick. Paul was sick all his life. I got a good friend named Nathan Bemis. has a church out in Montana, and Nathan Bemis was a character. I wish everybody in America could meet Nathan Bemis. He's a character. He wasn't, he wasn't, he might have been dumb as an ox, but he wasn't any smarter. <laughs> and that guy, he'd, he'd spell Bible, B-I-B-U-L. <laughs> he flunked the second grade, flunked the second grade, man. That's rough when you can't pass the second grade. <laughs> then he went off the Navy before he was 18, never finished the fifth grade. That old boy loved the Lord, and he knows that book, too, brother. That bird is spiritual. But one night he went down to Spencer School and got a hold of Ewing. Ewing had a big fiasco down there, and he caught Ewing behind the uh, props one night. And he said, uh, was Paul ever sick? And Ewing said, yes. And, pa and Nathan Bemis said, did he ever get well? And Miss Heather said, yes. And Nathan handed him a Bible and said, you show me that. And he said, well, you come back tomorrow night. I'll talk about that tomorrow night. And Nathan said, just show it to me. I'll take it. Just show it to me. And Ewing said, well, I was going to preach on that tomorrow night. Oh, liar. 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 <laughs> Some of you folks don't think I said that. Liar! He got the fifth time. And, you know, Nathan came back to me. He's all upset, you know, crying. Tenderhearted fellow, you know. Brother Pete, that man's deceiving those people, you know. Well, you know me. I mean, I was in fellowship with the devil so long, don't shock me any. <laughs> 27 years full-time fellowship. And stuff like that, you know, in my attitude. Well, that's where the snow blows, you know. I mean, when a sucker a minute, I don't think anything about it. But old Nathan got all upset. He said, we got to do something about that fellow. He's deceiving them, folks. <laughs> he got praying. <laughs> You know what happened two nights later? Two nights later, there was a healing line going by there, and Ewing healed one of those ladies, and he dropped dead of a heart attack right in the healing line. You know, be healed, blop! <laughs> man, the like had to ride down there and call out the police. He had to leave town, man. Boy, he went out in a cloud of dust. Talking about how those folks down there persecuted him. Yeah, you bet your boots. You know something? I believe in healing. Why, you couldn't, you couldn't tell me I don't believe in healing. I can never remember my family healed one time or another. Now, I'm standing in front of you tonight drawing these uh, pictures here tonight. Now, now, where do you think I'd be if I didn't believe in healing? Seven weeks ago, I had a contest with an L&M train, and those are the most selfish things in the world. <laughs> they won't get off the track for nobody, man. You have the right of way, don't pay a bit of attention to you, just keep right on coming. And that thing hit me right in the middle in a barred paint van I was driving. Right in the middle, man, took me 250 feet down that track. And just didn't turn me over because the, 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 the wheels got caught in the gravel. That thing was rolling out. I was bouncing, banging all around that thing, trying to find the ignition, get that thing off. I could see myself going up like a roast marshmallow with all that gasoline kerosene in that thing. And that thing finally stopped with a slant like that. I never bothered to try the door, man. I went out the window. <laughs> I mean, I went down the window and ran down the side of that siding. And then, I, you know, when things like happen, you can't feel nothing. You got so much adrenaline, you don't know where you even hurt or not. So I worked my fingers. Okay, you know. My shoulder a few times. Something here's going click, click, clack, click, clack. I know something wrong there. <laughs> I do a few neat bends, you know, down like this. Something going, <clears throat> this leg here, something wrong there. A bunch of people come around saying, stand still, rest, don't breathe, all that kind of stuff. But you can't find out what's the matter with you lying around, man. <laughs> and I walked up and down there a while, and I'm you know, a few deep breaths, found I couldn't breathe very deep. And they finally took him off the hospital, and they said, well, you've got a dislocated shoulder and separated the collarbone and the sternum, and fractured one rib and split another one and punctured your lung and got blood in your kidneys. And so I get, I get, I got about 20,000 people praying for me. There's a great advantage, you know, to be in evangelistic work for 28 years. <laughs> and in three days I was in the hospital and a week I was walking and two weeks I was running and now I'm handling my hole and my shovel out there in the garden. Now don't you tell me I don't believe in healing. But I'll tell you, I sure didn't go down to a line and walk down there with my little card. <laughs> And they get from those spotlights for the organ play, you know. And, uh, in the name of Jesus, be healed, you know. <laughs> Hitch in the head, dislocate another shoulder if you're not careful. <laughs> Amen, brother. Now, you take this thing right here. When Moses shows up, Moses has those signs given to Israel. Do you know why in the New Testament tongues are for a sign? Because the Jews seek for a sign. 
This is the charismatic preacher in this town. He can tell you what tongues are for. Go and ask him. Take the first 35 charismatics you see and say, what are tongues? You know what that deceit idiot will say? He'll say, they're the initial evidence of baptism of the Holy Ghost. You open your Bible and say, you show me that? He, could, he, couldn't, find, he couldn't find a bowling ball in a bathtub. <laughs> well, that Bible says in 1 Corinthians 14, 22, wherefore tongues are for a sign. You know why they're a sign? Because the Jewish nation begins with signs. So the Jews seek for a sign. And when God quit dealing with the Jews, the signs go. Did you ever read the Acts of the Apostles? Every apostle is a circumcised, pork abstaining, Sabbath observing, temple worshiping Jew. The signs of Israel. All right, it comes on down from Moses. And come on down to Moses, and then they come into the promised land and bring in the kingdom. And after a while, the people say, Give us a king. And the Lord said, I'm your king. And they said, Nay, nay, but we want a king, a king, a king, a king, like the nations round about us to go in and go out and fight our battle for us. And Samuel cried all night. And the Lord said to Samuel, They haven't rejected you. They've rejected me that I should not be king over them. And so the first king Israel has is a demon-possessed homicidal maniac, Saul, counting the witches, necromancy. And the Lord said, I don't want anything to do with it. I'm going to find a man after my own heart. He went out there on the hillside, and he said, uh, I'm going to get me a king from Bethlehem. Why? Because Bethlehem is the house of Judah, and the scepter shall not depart from Judah. Saul wasn't from Judah. He was from Benjamin. And the Lord called this man out and said, I found a man after my own heart. And got him out there, and he said, I'm going to make you king. The first God-ordained king of the Jews is David. Take your Bible and turn to Matthew chapter 1, look at verse 6. Matthew chapter 1, verse 6. In the genealogy in Matthew chapter 1, the first time you find any word king showing up, in Matthew chapter, uh, Matthew chapter five, uh, one, 1, verse 6, the first time you find the word king in regard to Israel is David the king. Jesse, who begat David the king, the king, the king. When God talked about a king over the kingdom of heaven, he's talking about David. And that's the first God-ordained king that Israel ever had. Now, you know what happened? The kingdom of heaven then belonged to that Jew. And that Jew had a kingdom of heaven, and Solomon reigned over that kingdom of heaven. And Solomon was promised certain mercies that nobody was promised in the Old Testament. The Lord said about David's seed, I'll not take my mercy from him as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before him. So even when Solomon messed up, he still had the crown. And when Solomon was king, Solomon was the son of David. Therefore, the reign of Solomon is a picture of the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. Now, how do you know that? Because Jesus Christ is called the son of David. Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, verse 2. And when Solomon is king, the Jews have all the land that belongs to them. They have all the land that belongs to them that they didn't have before. And every man is under his fig tree and every man under his vine tree, from Dan to Beersheba, all the days of Solomon. Solomon's reign on earth is a picture of the millennial reign of Christ when the Gentiles come and take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew and say, Come, let's go to Jerusalem, but the law won't perish from Jerusalem. Let's go up and see what the Lord has to say at Jerusalem. Then if you read your Bible in First Kings, the Second Kings, and First Chronicles, and Second Chronicles, you find there's degeneration. Ah, brethren, I'll tell you. If there's one thing that holds true with the law of materialism, it's that everything deteriorates or falls apart. Murphy's Law is much more sound than the law of gravity. Murphy's Law is if anything can go wrong, it will, <laughs> at the worst possible time. <laughs> and things are always a little bit worse than they seem. <laughs> it's deterioration. Look here. God gives the guy a perfect environment, a perfect heredity. What does he do? Disobeys. Pulls him out, protects him as a murderer, takes care of him. What does he do? rebellion against God. God grounds him out, gives him a brand new earth, all for himself, with nobody to bother him. What does he do? He gets drunk. Calls out a guy out of the Chaldees. What does he do? Lies about his wife. Picks him up, makes the richest man in the world, kid go down to Egypt, become slave laborers. Hauls him out of Egypt, blesses him, gives him water out of a rock, rain from heaven, manna from heaven, houses they didn't build, big trees they didn't plant, all this property. What does he do? They go after Baal and Ashtoreth. What does God do? Send him a king, bring him the kingdom, get the thing set up. What does he do? Multiplies wives, 
that's against the Deuteronomic law. Goes to Egypt for horses, that's against the Deuteronomic law. Multiplies gold to himself, against the Deuteronomic law. <laughs> whole thing goes down the drain. I'll tell you, brethren, if I've learned one lesson, I've learned this. I've learned I can't trust me as far as I can kick this building with my left foot. If I've learned one lesson in Christian life, I've learned that if God helps a man, he'll be helped, and if God don't help a man, he can't get no help. That's all there is to it. It's just like that. If I've learned one thing, man, I've learned that one. I got that one down. I'll tell you, if God answers prayer, there's hope, and if he don't, there ain't no hope. We're incurably wicked, brother. Like the old song says, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. I want Jesus Christ to come back. Amen. You say, why? Just to stop this old backsliding, downgraded mess, that's why. <laughs> and you know what happens when he comes back in such a perfect kingdom with no devil and no demons? You know what happens at the end of that period of time? Yep. Down the tube. <laughs> I tell you, brother, there's no cure for man. Man is desperately wicked. Boy, tell that to the National Education Association. And there's old Kaniah. Take your Bible and turn to Jeremiah 22. And when Kaniah finally shows up in the throne, that country's an apostasy. The ten northern tribes have gone into captivity. They're shot. And when Kaniah shows up in that throne, the Lord gets so mad at him, he says in Jeremiah 22, and look about the last five verses, Jeremiah 22, about the last five verses, he says in Jeremiah 22, O earth, 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 hear the word of the Lord. Look at that thing. What verse is that? What is it? 29? Jeremiah 22, 29, O earth, earth, earth. Well, that's aimed at anybody. That isn't aimed at the Jew or the church or the Gentile. That's aimed at anybody it breathes. O earth, earth, hear the word of the Lord. There's something about Kaniah that everybody in the world needs to read. What is it? Come down to the next two verses. Write ye this man childless, for no man of his seed shall prosper any more, sitting upon the throne of Judah in the house of David. You know what the Lord said? He said, that crown, the throne, the throne, the throne ends right there, and from there on, nobody's ever going to get on that throne again. The crown goes off, and right there the Jew lost the kingdom of heaven, and that crown went, and from there the time of Christ, 606 B.C., the time of Christ, the Gentiles are in charge of the literal, physical, visible kingdom of this earth. That's when Gentile history begins, Nebuchadnezzar, Cyrus. Artaxerxes, Alexander the Great, Caesar. It begins there. The Jews all through. In 606 B.C., the Lord said, Get rid of that throne, and no man of his seed, seed comes away from Adam, is going to prosper anymore on that throne. And when Zedekiah shows up, the last king that Judah had, before Nebuchadnezzar the king came in, when Zedekiah showed up there, and the Nebuchadnezzar came in and took that kingdom, Zedekiah, in God's sight, didn't even have a crown. The crown God had gone. You know what you read in Lamentations? You read, Woe unto us, because the crown has fallen. You know who that was written by? That was written by a fellow who was right there when Nebuchadnezzar came in in 598 B.C. and raped those women and tore that temple up and burned that place to the ground. And that's the end of it. You're now in the times of the Gentiles. All right, now take your Bible and turn to Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2. The Jews go off into captivity, and the long, weary years pass by. They're off there in captivity and looking for the kingdom. The kingdom's gone. And they say, we sat down by the rivers of Babylon. We hang the harps and the willows thereof. And they said, sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall I sing of the Lord's song in a strange land? He said, if I forget the old Jerusalem, may my right hand forget its cunning. If I prefer not Jerusalem above my chief joy. They're off there, the crown is gone, the Gentiles are running things, the devil's in charge of Jerusalem, the smoked out ruins are lying there, charred and waste. The half breed Assyrians are coming back and filling the land full of half breed Samaritans, and Israel's all through. And it looks like that's the end of it. Daniel 2. <laughs> Daniel 2 is a king. Daniel chapter 2, verse 1 and 2, this king has a dream. And he dreams about a great big old statue. When he calls in Daniel, Daniel says, Thou, O king, art thou head of gold, that head of gold. The chief subject of that Bible, brethren, is the kingdom. That's what that book is about. And Daniel gets to interpret that dream, and Daniel says, well, I'll tell you what. He says the first kingdom is Nebuchadnezzar, Babylon, the next one is Persia, the next one is Greece, the next one is Rome. And then after a while, you're going to have ten toes sitting down there, a ten-toed kingdom. And in the days of those kings, 
God shall set up the kingdom that shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be delivered to other people, but the saints shall possess the kingdom. Old Daniel said there's going to come a time when the Son of, one like the Son of Man comes and takes that throne and dominion and power are given him, and Daniel prophesies, the crowns haven't showed up, but Daniel said it's coming, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. Now, let's go to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1. Daniel said it's coming. Mark chapter 1, verse 1. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophets. If you have the right Bible, it says prophets, because the quotation you're about to read is one from Malachi and one from Isaiah. If you have a Bible that says, as is written the prophet Isaiah, you have a devil's Bible, because the quotation is not from Isaiah. The quotation is from Isaiah and Malachi. Therefore, if you have a King James Bible, you have the only Bible that is a Bible. Because every other version of the market says the prophet Isaiah. And the quotation is not from the prophet Isaiah. <laughs> if you don't believe it, look it up. Now, the, the greatest cure for ignorance and prejudice is 2020 vision. <laughs> Isaiah said one of those statements, and Malachi said the other. So if you have a Bible that says the prophet Isaiah, you have a Bible that isn't any Bible at all. That's fraud. You know in a courtroom what a fellow says when he says, so-and-so said this, and he didn't say it? It was him and another fellow, and the fellow just said, I swear to tell the truth, whole truth, not the truth, help me, God. You know what that is? That's fraud, boy. That's perjury on the roof. Those new Bibles are put out by perjurers. So I know a great good godly man that recommends them. Well, David's a good godly man. Would you trust the wife with him? Folks don't think, you know, this old charger there just blind as a bat coming in backwards. All right, now, Mark chapter 1, the voice of one that cry out the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord. Here comes old John the Baptist. Old John the Baptist shows up in the wilderness. They come around to John and say, who are you? He said, I passed through the largest church in California. I baptized 5,000 converts a year. We run 300 Sunday school buses and our enrollment last year in properties. Well, he didn't say that. You know what he said? He said, I'm the voice of one crying in the wilderness. John would walk a mile for a camel because that was his clothing. <laughs> Question, if clothes make the man, what was John? <laughs> and that boy's out there baptizing those folks, you know, and about that time said, what's your message, boy? He said, repent, the kingdom of God is at hand. Yeah, he said that one time. And then the other one, he said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And they said, you got your Bible kind of screwed up, John. They're never the same. And he said, they may not be the same, but they're both coming. And when John showed up, John said, one, repent, the literal, physical, visible, earthly dominion of the Jewish Davidic Messiah on the throne is coming, and that ain't all. He said, something's coming that hadn't been around here since Adam. That kingdom of God is coming. You know why some people think the kingdom of God and kingdom of heaven are the same? Because some parables match both of them. There are some parables about the kingdom of God that match the kingdom of heaven. So when they say they're the same, they say they must be the same. No, man, there are a lot of parables about the kingdom of heaven that have nothing to do with the kingdom of God at all. Tares and wheat. There are no tares and wheat in the kingdom of God than in the kingdom of heaven. Good fish and bad fish. Not in the kingdom of God, in the kingdom of heaven. When you talk about the literal, physical, earthly dominion, you're talking about saved and lost people together. When you talk about the kingdom of God, you're talking about only saved spiritual beings. Adam, made in Christ's image, Christ, the image of God, and you, if you're born again, renewed after the image of him that made him. Amen. So when John shows up, John says, get ready, they're coming, they're coming. Somebody said, what's coming? He said, the kingdom of God. What else? The kingdom of heaven. And so what happened? Well, you know what happened. One night the angels got singing, or shouting, or both, and somebody said, what are you shouting about? And raising my fuss about. They said, unto you there is this day in the city of David, a Savior which is born, which is Christ the Lord. And Luke chapter 1, the Lord God shall give to him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Amen. Literal, physical, Amen. Jewish, Davidic Amen. 
Palestinian kingdom at Jerusalem. Amen. Got that? Amen. Now, if you get that, you know more than the United Nations knows. You've got a king that's coming, that king comes to get a literal, earthly, physical throne over a literal, physical dominion. There's no spirit to it. David's throne was not spiritual. You could sat on it. <laughs> Why, well, that's called the throne of his glory in Matthew 19, the throne of his glory in Matthew 25. And that's the term Jeremiah used when he preached to Zedekiah. Do not disgrace the throne of thy glory. Jeremiah, chapter 5 and chapter 9. These people think Jesus Christ sitting down and reigning the throne right now the kingdom is coming. They're, they're cracked, man. They're cracked. Why, Jesus Christ not running this earth right now? Do you think Jesus Christ running this earth? Why, this earth is given to the devil. Christ said, all power is given to me in heaven and earth, and the kingdom of this earth are delivered to Satan until Christ comes back. Don't you remember Jesus Christ showed up? The devil came up to him and he said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll give you all this stuff here. They're mine. Right. See? They're not the Jews. He lost it. They came under the devil. And the devil said, they're mine. I'll give them anybody I want them. You want them? The Lord said, sure, I want them. The devil said, okay, bow down and worship me one time. I'll give them to you. And the Lord said, listen. I'll get them later without cutting any corners. And he's going to get them. Amen. People talk about Christ reigning now as king. Why, well, he's not reigning king over the house of Jacob? Do you mean to tell me a king who rules over the house of Jacob would let six million of his subjects be tortured to death and burned to death in ovens? What kind of king is that? You better impeach him, hadn't you? Why, listen, Jesus Christ not running Washington, D.C. You can't have some pious peanut get up there and say, I've been born again, and you ask him what that means. He says, well, you know, I always did believe, you know, in God and Christ. That isn't a new birth. The devil's believe and tremble. Larry Flint said, I've been born again. Somebody said, what's that? That means I got a new set of moral standards and precepts. That ain't the new birth. That's whitewash. <laughs> Why, listen, the Lord's not running the United Nations. I want to speak reverently, and you won't think I am. You'll think I'm a terrible to say what I'm going to say, but I will say it. If Jesus Christ is reigning over the kings of this earth right now and over the Gentiles, over the Jews, like the Bible said he will, he's done the rottenest job any king has done since Cain knocked Abel's brains out. Now, how's that? You mean to tell me the king of glory couldn't stop 54 wars? I guarantee when he comes back next time, nobody's going to start nothing. <laughs> and the first time they start, then the millennium, they're in hell so fast, they don't know what happened to them. Ain't going to be fooling around with this thing, unilateral disarmament, salt treaty. God bless you, dear folks. <laughs> if Carter sat down there and dog hammer showed and the herder and chamber and hiss and Blankoff and Zukov and Castro and all those fellows signed the treaty in their own blood, it wouldn't be worth the papers written on. Don't you know that? Some of you folks are going to stay up late tonight watch the 11 o'clock newscast. What are they doing about the disarmament? They're getting loaded at the gills. Boy, that's what they're doing. <laughs> they're getting all the stuff they can get to throw at it for you and throw what you've got at them. When Jesus Christ comes... Well, I've got to get on here. When Jesus Christ comes back in this earth, he comes back as King of kings and Lord of lords and the Prince of peace, and there's no peace on earth till God, God gets glory in the highest. When that baby was born, those angels showed up. They said, glory to God in the highest, and earth, peace, goodwill to men. And there's no peace on earth, and there's no goodwill to men, but God gets the glory in the highest. And they've never given him the glory in the highest. And they gave him, they gave him less glory right now than they ever did. Christmas time, come around, you see a big sign out there, peace on earth, goodwill to men. You left out a third of the verse. Oh, Papa Paul, get up, peace on earth, goodwill to men. Hey, stupid, you left out a third of the verse. President Carter, get up, peace on earth, good way. Hey, boy, get the rest of that verse. I watch him do that thing every Christmas for 20 years. Peace on earth, peace on earth. There is no peace on earth till there's glory to God. And when Jesus Christ comes again, brother, there'll be glory to God in the highest, and thy will done on earth as it is in heaven. And until he comes back, you're just not going to have it. You're not going to have it. Folks talk about bringing the kingdom, the lion, the calf, lying down together. Brother, I'll tell you, the lion and the calf may lie down together right now, but the calf ain't going to do much sleeping. <laughs> All right, when Jesus Christ shows up, don't you know what you're dealing with? When Jesus Christ shows up, what is he? Why, you know what he is. He's the son of man, right? Is he born of Mary? Earthly, literal, physical, visible body. Amen. He gets tired. He gets thirsty. He gets hungry. He cries. 
I thirst. He wept. Literal, physical, visible king over a literal, physical, visible kingdom. What else is he? You know what he is. He didn't get his blood from Joseph. He got his blood from God. Acts chapter 20, verse 28, talk about God purchased with his own blood. What is he? He's the son of God. He's made in God's image. He's the first man made in the image of God since Adam lost the crown. That's why he's called the last Adam, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So there's no new birth from there to there, even when they're saved. Calvin was wrong. In the Old Testament, a man dead in trespass and sin has a free will to act and obey God and please God. And he's responsible for his acts. Now, if somebody tell these people out here aren't responsible for what they do if they're born again, God has to give them a new birth before they can act. You're responsible for your actions whether you're born again or not. That Bible says, Be not deceived, God is not marked, whatever a man sows. He didn't say a Christian. Whatever a man sows. That's the universal law. You're responsible for your actions. All right, Jesus shows up. Now you know what happened, don't you? He came down to Jerusalem on the car on the, the, the coat, the full of an ass. And he comes down through Jerusalem at crowds out there saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. You get that? The Son of David. Glory to God, my highest on earth. Peace, goodwill toward men. Hosanna, the Son of David. Hail, King of the Jews. Take him out there, put him on a cross, crucify him, nail a plaque over his head. It says, this is Jesus, the King of the Jews. And the Jews said, say not that he is King of the Jews. Just say, he said, I am King of the Jews. And Pilate said, what I have written, I have written. You always kind of get the funny feeling you read that, at least the way I do. I always get the kind of funny feeling that Pilate always did think he was the King of the Jews. I never get over that feeling reading those passages. I went around there and they said, how about letting us seal the tomb? He said, make it as sure as you can. <laughs> you know, like, you, like, you know, you, you probably can't hold him down. I think Pilate kind of thought all along there was something supernatural about it. Amen. Wife woke up and said, I have nothing to do with this just man. The Jews said he made himself a son of God. But Pilate had a lot on his mind. All right, look at here. He died and he was buried. And he rose again the third day from the dead. He rose again from the dead and rose up the third day from the dead. He was with them 40 days and 40 nights, speaking the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Got it? That kingdom. And when he talked about that, they said, Lord, wilt thou at this time again restore the kingdom, that one, to Israel? And he said, It is not for you to know the time and the season which the Father kept in his own power, but you shall see the power after the Holy Ghost come upon you. You shall be witness to me in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and the most parts of the earth. So when they said, What about that literal, physical, visible kingdom? He didn't say it wouldn't come. He didn't say it was all over. He didn't deny it. He just said, It's not for you to know what's going to happen. The thing for you to do is get started. So they get started. And he goes back to glory. And listen. When he went back to glory, you know what crown he took with him? Why, well, sure you know what crown he took with him. He took back a crown to a literal, physical, visible kingdom of heaven. Because he was king of the Jews, and the Jews rejected their king. So, brethren, there's no kingdom of heaven from now till Jesus Christ comes back. Amen. And knowing that, Jesus Christ said, I'll tell you, I'll do, I'll tell you about the mysteries Amen. of the kingdom of heaven. Because it ain't going to be here. It's going to be here in a mystery form. That's what Matthew 13 is about. Ah, oh, the unsearchable riches of the archaic Elizabethan English. How profound are its judgments and its ways past finding out. Amen. Uh, these folks say, well, I've got to have these new translations and I just don't understand that Bible. I'd like to have anybody in Ohio show me one thing you ever found a new translation I can't find in the King James Bible. I'd like to see it. You've got to have the Hebrew and the Greek. You know a Hebrew and Greek scholar in this town anywhere? You haven't come to me. I'll be here till Wednesday. I'm in room 109, Colonial Inn, Highway 35. And have him show me one thing in Hebrew Greek I can't find in 15 seconds in the King James Bible. I'd like to see that. Folks say, you're bragging. Yeah, I'm talking like a fool, but I enjoy making a fool out of myself once in a while. <laughs> now, Peter shows up. You know what Peter does? He gets up there. You know what he thinks? He thinks the sin to eat pork. Why, in Acts chapter 10, he hadn't got the thing fixed up yet. And when Simon Peter gets up in Acts chapter 10, he says, Lord says, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. And he says, Not so, nothing uncommon or unclean to touch my lips. Why, Peter thought it was a sin to eat lobster, trip Acts chapter 10. 
You know what that stuff was done away with? It was done away with right there. Did you know everything that happened there isn't clear in the early part of the book of Acts? In Acts chapter 2, when Simon Peter gets up to preach in Acts chapter 2, he doesn't say, by grace you say through faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. He says, like any good Campbellite, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for remission of sins, and you receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for the promise of you, and so forth and so on. Why, all kinds of things happen here that Peter didn't know about. Why, the, the morning Jesus Christ rose from the dead out there in the Sea of Galilee, and Peter was out fishing, and Jesus said, you got any meat? He said, no. He said, come here, I'll fix you something. What if Peter, James, and John had sailed in there and looked at that grill, and there were oysters, clam, and catfish? <laughs> They'd like to have a heart attack, man. That Bible is in Leviticus 11. It's a sin. You think it doesn't have fins and scales. But it would have been all right, wouldn't it? Why, sure, wasn't the handwriting of ordinances done away with at Calvary? Sure it was, but nobody knew about it. You've got to get that Bible right. You know what happened at Calvary? Your salvation was completed. You don't have to get baptized to get the Holy Spirit. But Peter didn't know that in Acts chapter 2. Why, in Acts chapter 10, Peter's standing up there and saying, Whoever believes on him shall receive remission of sins. And he's just about to say, like any good Campbellite, of those born in water, three, of those born on earth, free of water outright, a mosquito, a tadpole, and a Campbellite. <laughs> and, and he got there where he said, Who be shall receive mission of sins? And he was just about to say, Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for mission of sins. You know what happened? The Holy Ghost came down and messed up the messages and saved them without water baptism. You know what that is? That's Acts 10. You know what that shows you? That shows you from that Acts 10, things are undergoing a transition. That's why every heretic in this town will live and die and go to hell in Acts 2.38 before he go to heaven in Romans 10. Every heretic in this town is in Acts chapter 2. You know why? Because he backslid and went back before the revelations were given and pretended he didn't have them. You know when your salvation was completed? Right there. Amen. You know what Simon Peter says was completed in Acts 3? He said it would be completed when Christ came back. Repent, that your sins may be brought out when the times of refreshing shall come the presence of the Lord, and he shall send Jesus whom the heaven must receive until the time of the restitution of all things spoken about the prophets. You won't find Simon Peter knowing anything about a complete salvation by grace through faith in the shed blood of Jesus Christ until Acts chapter 8 and 9. And that's where every Bible-perverting, lovey-dovey, kiss-me-hug-me, charismatic, money-grabbing crook in this town is in Acts 2. Because he's a crook and denied advanced revelation. Do you think about this thing here? When Simon Peter gets up in Acts chapter 2, nobody has Matthew, nobody has Mark, nobody has Luke, nobody has John, nobody has Romans, nobody has Colossians. The guy that wrote Ephesians hadn't even been saved yet. When Peter gets up in Acts chapter 2, his audience are all circumcised Jews or circumcised proselytes, and all they've got is Genesis and Malachi. And if you want the folks who want to get the Holy Ghost, they say yes. He said, okay, go down and get baptized. You can ice that ice to unto or four to your blue in the face, and the fact remains the people in Acts chapter 2 were not promised the Holy Ghost unless they were baptized. And you're told in Galatians chapter 3 that you Gentiles receive the promise of the Spirit by faith. You do not get saved according to Acts 2.38. If you're trying to count Acts 238 to save you, son, you're just good in hell with the door shut and the key thrown away. You know why we Baptists baptize in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost? Because that's Gentile baptism, Matthew 28. We're not baptizing Jewish converts at Pentecost who are looking for a sign. Stupid. <laughs> We're baptizing Gentiles. Amen. Folks say, why do you have to be that way? To get it through your thick head. I know what I'm dealing with. I mean, some of you folks open-minded, but some of you folks got a head like a mahogany table. I'm going to cut through you with a butter knife. It's going to take a double-bladed axe, brother. I'll get back to this in a minute. But you know something? You, you, can, you can listen to Rex Humbard and Jimmy Swaggart and Captain Cullman and Ruth Carter Stapleton, or whatever her name is, until you're red, white, blue in the face, and those people couldn't kill a butterfly with a 12-pound sledgehammer. <laughs> Their preaching is so light and so soft, they couldn't cripple a butterfly's wing with a 12-pound double-bladed axe, man. And some of you folks need to get this stuff through your head. 
The uh, Bible says you ought to be rooted. You ought to be grounded. You ought to have sound doctrine. They leave on at God's earth. Well, every time some nut comes through here, all you people say, defect from what you've learned in a good, solid Bible-believing Baptist church. Run off following every sleight of hand and wind of doctrine. Somebody stand there. God bless you. Oh, the Lord bless you. Glory to God. Oh, hallelujah. 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 Boy, I'm telling you, they got, a, they got a guy going around this country putting out these youth tension conflicts and some other psychological mess and charging people hundreds of dollars to come and get that junk and notebooks. A guy gave me the notebook and all the lessons in it. He wasn't supposed to, but I got it. <laughs> and picked that thing. You know what that fellow's doing? That fellow's going down this country applying 300 verses aimed at saved people in the Pauline epistles to unsaved people to make them think they're all right. And Christian lapping that stuff up like a hog lacking up garbage. All right, Peter's up there preaching. Hadn't had it revealed to him yet. He says, repent, repent. They say, how come? The kingdom's coming. The kingdom's coming. Christ is coming back. Gets on there preaching about time, Acts chapter 7. Stephen gets up. Stephen comes up for the Sanhedrin. Some of his buddies said, boy, I'll go up and hear him, but I sure hope he used more tact and diplomacy than he had been using. <laughs> and they got up there in the Sanhedrin. Oh, Stephen got up to preach. And old Stephen gets up there and he says, Hearken, men and brethren, the Lord of glory appeared. Abraham takes the thing clean back there and starts all the way through again. And he starts down there and he comes down there and he says, And Joseph did that and the patriarchs moved then they sold Joseph in Egypt. And then they were evil inflicted and Moses went down there and bought the people out. And Moses bought the people out there and brought them out to the wilderness. Deuteronomy chapter 33 says, Moses was king in Jeshurun. Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse 8, a king. And he brought them out like that, and he said they turned back in their hearts, they wouldn't listen to what he had to say. And about that time, the Lord up in heaven is standing off the throne. He says, all right now, Michael, if they accept this message, you blow the trumpet. And when you blow the trumpet, all those safe people down there go up in a moment and drink them an eye. Amen. And as they come up, then have Judas come up from the bottomless pit, and get into that Roman Caesar and let him make a covenant with them Jews for three and a half years and let that tribulation start and I'll be back in seven years. Michael says, yes, sir. Gets ready to blow. And Stephen's down there raving and ranting. And he says, Brother Solomon, build him a temple. How be it the most high? Well, if not, temples made with hands. As saith the prophet, heaven is my throne, 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 throne. Don't forget that throne. Heaven is my throne. There is my footstool. What house will you build me? See, my hand hath made all these things. You stiff necked and uncircumcised and heart and ears. You do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did. So do ye, which are the prophets. Oh, what a message, man. What a message. Just one big scathing negative blast, man. See people leaving all over the building, you know. <laughs> Ladies taking the kids out, some fellow get them <laughs> going out the door, you know. And he said, Which of the prophets have you persecuted and have slain the one that showed before the coming of the just one, of whom you have been the betrayers and murderers, who received the disposition of the law of angels and have not kept it? Every head bowed, every eye shut. If there's somebody like to raise the hand and say, Pray for me, I'd like to rededicate my life. <laughs> and they all ran down there and gnashed on him with their teeth and took him outside the city and rocked his brains out. And he got down to his knee, looked up. And he saw the Lord standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Lord, what are you doing standing up? <laughs> I thought you were seated at the right hand of God. And the Lord said, well, I was seated. And I thought he was going to have a long rest, but I was about to come back. But in view of the deterioration of the situation, I'm going to sit down and take me a long nap. And he sat down at the right hand of God, and he's been sat ever since. Amen. And he leaned up against the throne like this with his eyes shut, getting a long rest. <laughs> And he's saying, Lord, bless Pete Ruckman down there, and bless Brother Fleming, those folks, and bless Mother Month down in Cincinnati, and Lord, and let, get me down all that mess he's in, Lord, and take care of me. He'd make intercession for the saints. Amen. He's a priest up there in prayer. Amen. And he isn't going to get up again until the church goes out, and then he'll get up again, and then all hell's going to break loose. Amen. You say, what'd you learn that from? I learned that from the King James 1611 authorized Amen. version. And just as soon as his brain get rocked out, the Lord saves Ham, chapter 8, Say Shem, chapter 9, and say Japheth, chapter 10. Right. That's Ham, Ethiopian eunuch. That's Shem, Paul, that's Cornelius, that's Japheth. That's right. First, what's a Ruckmanite? And this fellow said, a Ruckmanite, somebody that believes the King James Bible doesn't have any errors in it. 
And this kid said, yeah, I believe that. And this PhD said, Ruckman taught you that, you're following a man. And this kid said, do you believe it does have errors in it? And the PhD said, yes, of course. And our kid said, who taught you that? What man are you following? Ah, oh, there's some food for thought. Brother, let me ask you something. If you found mistakes in it, who showed them to you? Did the Lord show them to you? They have a hard time figuring me out. I appreciate Brother Fleming asking me in here to preach from time to time. He's been real faithful through the years and taking his life into his hands several times by being associated with the mark of the beast. <laughs> but they can't, uh, they can't figure me out. They say, well, it's just this and that. How are you going to explain where I got my belief from? Do you ever think about that? I believe the King James Bible is the Word of God from cover to cover, including the cover. Amen. Question, who taught me that? I just don't step in. Think a while. I mean, I believe that. Who taught me that? I didn't learn it at Bob Jones. I was there for six years. They didn't teach me that. They taught me the 31,000 changes in the ASV were better than the King James. I didn't learn it there. I didn't learn it two years at the University of Kansas. Those folks weren't even saved. They didn't even recommend an ASV. I didn't u learn it two years at the University of Alabama. Unsaved man. I didn't believe the Bible at the University of Alabama. Where did I learn it from? I didn't learn it from my mother and daddy. My mother and daddy were unsaved Episcopalians. Who taught me that? Ah, that's a good question. <laughs> you know something? There are only two people who could. Either the Lord taught me that or the devil taught me that. Now you just make up your mind which it is. When you and I get the judgment seat of Christ, we'll have us a time. One scholar told me one time, he said, Now, Ruckman, he said, You know that thing got errors in it. I said, No, I don't. You show me one. Of course, I never can. And he said, What are you going to do when you get the judgment seat of Christ when you know the original is written in Greek? I said, When I get the judgment seat of Christ, I'm going to say, Dear Lord, Please forgive me for telling all these people the Bible is the Word of God. I'm so sorry. I deceived them. <laughs> Please forgive me. <laughs> Don't you know it's never going to happen? Brethren, if that book is not the Word of God, I'll get less to pay at the judgment seat of Christ for saying it was than you get for saying that it wasn't if it was. <laughs> you follow me? Amen. All right, now look at here. One of these days, in the moment, the twinkling of an eye, the Lord himself shall heaven, seven heaven to shout, the voice of the came the trump of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first, we which shall live remain shall be caught up together with the clouds to meet in the Lord in the air, so shall we with the Lord. All right, one day out goes the kingdom of God, and the crown goes off, and with the kingdom of God gone, and the kingdom of heaven was already up there because it left with Christ. You know what's on this earth? Oh, Nebuchadnezzar. <laughs> I mean, the last time both those crowns disappeared, you know, showed up on the sixes? Oh, 666. Six, six. Right. So the next time that crown goes out, and there's no kingdom of God, no kingdom of heaven, you know what there is? There's the kingdom of death, hell, sin, and Satan. Revelation 6. Behold, a white horse, Amen. and he that sat upon him had a crown. Got it? The subject of that book is a throne authority. Salvation is an incidental. The devil shows up, he's got a crown. What happens? You know what happens? Christ comes back, battle of Armageddon. When he comes back, he blows that whole thing all to pieces, and he sets up a kingdom because he's king of kings and lord of lords. At the end of the 1,000 years, the heaven and earth melt with a fervent heat. The works that are there shall be burned up, and the elements shall be dissolved with a great noise. Did you ever read that in 2 Peter 3, a great noise? Did you ever stop thinking what a sound that thing would be? What a, what a sound, a great noise. Think of that, man. <laughs> We're talking about an atom bomb, a hydrogen bomb. Can you imagine what it sounded like if the solar system blew up? Good night, what a racket. <laughs> and that thing all blows away. And then in comes a perfect kingdom where there's no more devil and no more sin and no more sorrow and no more death. And God wipes away all tears from their eyes, and God will dwell with them and be their God, and they shall be his people, and we'll be back where we were back over here, before the whole thing started. Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending. In the meantime, for 6,000 years, the three greatest clowns that ever showed up in the face of this earth, the three greatest imposters that ever professed to believe they were something when they weren't, are philosophy, religion, and science. You're living in a day and age when science and religion profess to have the cure. They couldn't cure a dead cat or a sick cat. 
Religion and science have never cured one problem anybody ever had. You know what science has done in 6,000 years? Science has made it possible for some of you folks to be reasonably comfort, uh, comfortable a little bit longer if you got the money. Now, you name me one thing any scientist ever did that ever accomplished anything for you or any of your friends that didn't cost money. It's a business. And if you can't afford it, you can't get it. Somebody said they make folks live longer. The bills are higher. You stay sick longer. You said they have these little medical conveniences. They can if you've got insurance. They say, take away the pain. You mean if you've got the money to buy the pills? Don't kid me. There are people in Africa and Asia who don't have any money to buy nothing with. You know what science done for them? Nothing. Never will. Science and religion are two big clowns. I think of a story where a bum went to a zoo and tried to get him a job. And they gave him a job dressed up like an ape and put him in a gorilla suit. And he stood out there in front of the kiddies and ran up and down, jumped up and down the bars and scratched himself, you know, and ate bananas and everything. And all the kiddies liked it. And one day he got kind of careless, showing off, and fell into the lion's cage. And boy, when he saw where he was, he screamed and ran up those bars and began to holler, Get me out! Get me out! In that gorilla suit. And that lion looked up at him and he said, Shut up, you fool. You want to have him find out about both of us? <laughs> And when I heard that illustration, I said to myself, you know what that is? That's science and religion, two of the biggest impostors that ever lived. Now listen, one of these days is coming back. We're going to wind it up now. Take your Bible and turn to Isaiah chapter 9, Isaiah 9, verse 7, and get 2 Peter chapter 3 in the other hand. Isaiah 9, 7, and 2 Peter chapter 3. You say, how come folks don't know about this? They won't read the book. They won't look at the book. A man said one time, he said, the reason why you don't like that book is because it knows all about you and tells it. And people don't fool with the book. Well, if you want to know the future, it's not in any time or news or life or look or any scientific journal. It's in the Bible. A man said one time, he said, the reason why you don't like that book is because it knows, you know all about, it knows all about you and tells it. The reason why you don't like that book is because it's against you. I was up flying one time in a Piper Cub with a fellow. He was taking me somewhere in Mississippi. We were flying along at night, and I said to him, I said, now, what if, what if, I'm, I said, I hope this don't happen, but I said, suppose right now your motor just stops. We're up here at 4,000 feet. Suppose your motor just stops. What's the school solution for getting out of this mess? I suppose you can't get the thing going. You don't know where you're at here. You're out in the middle of nowhere. He said, well, he said, you turn around into the wind, and you get into the wind first. Then he said, you feather down into the wind, and when you get about 80 feet off the ground, you turn on your ground lights, your landing lights, and see what's underneath you. And if you don't like what you see, you turn them back off. <laughs> <laughs> I thought of that many times with the Bible, you know that? People pick up that Bible, and they read just to where they find the part they don't like, and they shut it. I'll tell you a good habit to get and read a Bible. Pick up that Bible, no matter how many times it crosses you, just adjust yourself to it. You know why I have such a wild system of interpretation? Because I never make the Bible fit into my system. I keep adjusting my system to fit the book. And it may be kind of crazy, but after all, let God be true and every man a liar. Right. You know what God's going to do? Isaiah chapter 9. What does that verse say? The government should be upon his shoulders. And then going down there and say, and, and upon the increase of his government, there should be no end sitting upon the Throne of David, where's that thing? House of David? Throne of David. What verse is that? Seven. Seven. Isaiah 9, 7. And of the increase of his government, there should be no end. See? He wasn't talking about the time. He talking about the size. That's right. So the increase? The increase of his government? You know what the Lord's going to do? Well, the Bible says don't give any offense, neither to the Jew, nor to the church, nor the Gentile. So when God deals with them, he always deals with them in threes. So in eternity, you know what you have? You have a new heavens, that's one, and a new earth, that's two, and a new Jerusalem, that's a three. You know what God has for the church, the body of Christ? God has a new Jerusalem. For the Jew, the Lord has a new earth, because the promise the world was given was given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And the new heavens are given to the Gentiles for populating outer space, what you see over your head out there is meant to be populated and will be populated, but not by this bunch of proud, sex-mad, money-crazy, God-defying, Christ-rejecting, Bible-hating, egotistical perverts. Amen. 
I talked with a Ph.D. one time about these things, and he said, well, you can't tell me that all that stuff's out there just for nothing. He said, God wouldn't have had all these things you've been talking about happen down here, little old planet. His little old planet down here about the size of a peanut and the tail end of a solar system and the back end of an S-shaped nebula. He said, God wouldn't have all this stuff happen down in just one little old place you hardly see with all this out here. I said, sure he would. He said, what's the logic behind that? I said, well, he said, it'll all happen down here so it wouldn't stink up the whole place. <laughs> you know, they're, 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 don't you believe that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure? Well, then you're negative. The prevention is negative. The cure is positive. There's more power in an ounce of negative thinking than 10 pounds of positive thinking. You want to figure out the riddle of the universe, you don't look out there and say, oh, what a grand, big, glorious old man is going to come down and help us and show us how to have peace and live with each other. Oh, come to my arms, darling, and fix up my home. That's the positive outlook. The negative outlook is, thank God, this hell down here will never bust out any bigger than right here. And when God finally breaks out and populates it, he'll populate it with a sinless race of people like Adam and Eve before they fell. I had a mad dream one night, and it, uh, it stopped some of my Bible study for a while. You know, I don't believe reading the Bible drives you crazy. I think disobeying it drives you crazy. But I had a dream one night after I'd been through this thing four or five times, and I dreamt this thing was all over. And I was in New Jerusalem. And the Lord came around to me and said, uh, I got a job for you. I said, okay. He said, uh, we're populating the new heavens. So you take this man and woman and set them up here on this planet. So I take this man and woman and I, you know, angels, ministering spirits, the minister of those that should be heirs of salvation. That bunch inherited. And I pick up this man and this woman, and they've already eaten of the tree of life down in New Jerusalem. And I took them up this planet and put them down in the garden. And I say to them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And of all the trees in the garden, thou mayest freely eat. <laughs> but of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, thou shalt eat thereof. The day thou eat thereof, thou shalt surely die. <laughs> and about then I woke up, thought to myself, wouldn't that be something? And if you're just like Christ in the resurrection, then the thing goes out and multiplies infinitely forever on an infinite number of planets. And each one takes the whole cycle. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges. And I lay down my Bible for a while. My head began to get swim. Now, I'm not going to discourage you, brethren. You go ahead and read it. <laughs> but one thing, 7,000 years of foolishness he is not going to hold up God's plan. God's plan was to populate that universe with a race of sinless people to glorify his Son, and he is going to do it. All right. Father, bless the message tonight. And if some of these things aren't too clear to people here tonight, I pray they'll get clearer as time goes by. I've been long-winded tonight, pretty heavy, and I pray, Father, as they read their Bible from time to time, you'll point these things out to them. May they understand that you are God, that you are God, that you are God. And I don't understand that fully myself. I can't comprehend a being that's always been there and came from nowhere and is just there. But you said, I am that I am. And you're there, you said, because you were there. And that's all you said about it. And that's it. And we recognize it. We, we've seen it in our own lives. After 28 years of walking the pilgrim pathway, we know you're there. And though you're not as real to us, we'd like to have you be. We're very confused about your leadership at some times. And sometimes it all seems like a fairy tale, like a dream. And sometimes we wonder if even these things are so at times. And yet you carry us on. We're moved. We're caught up in a tide. We're moving toward eternity. And we know you're there. You're there. And we pray, Father, in Jesus' name, until the day we see thee, we might be faithful servants and faithful stewards. We pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Brother, come ahead tonight. Close the Lord leads you. All right. I definitely feel led to say some things. I think at Bob Jones University it takes, what, $6,000 for a year? Is that about right, Pete? About $6,000. That's room and board. And how many years down there? Four, four years? Six years. Six years? I mean, but I could go through it in four years, couldn't I? Yeah, but I went to two summer schools for three years. 6,000 times four is 24,000, ain't it? 
You guys check him. And I'm going to tell you something. You learn more tonight than you'd learn at four years at Bob Jones University. Amen? Or Hiles Anderson. So off us, ushers come. I want to take up the offering. I want everybody here to put in at least $24,000 tonight. Amen? That's pretty good clothing. Amen? I mean, this, this is the invitation, folks. <laughs> Man, I, I, you get to think about that. You've heard more Bible tonight and more truth tonight than you learn at Bob Jones or Hiles Anderson or, or Jerry Falwell's or any of the other. You wouldn't hear that. Amen? Thank you, Dr. Pete. That's all on tape, and we're going to sell them for $24,000 a tape. Amen? I don't know how many we sell, but... <laughs> Now, they'll be available for you, and I want you to know that. And uh, just uh, nominal.